Vicgrade is a relatively new body sitting with the Department of Energy, Environment, and Climate Action. Vicgrade is responsible for coordinating the planning and development of Victoria's renewable energy zones and the transmission network that connects renewable energy to the state's power grid. Six renewable energy zones have been identified in the state with the greatest potential for renewable energy, such as wind, sunshine, rain, tides, waves, and geothermal heat. Vicgrade is working to develop renewable energy zones in a coordinated way that delivers the infrastructure we need in the right places at the right time and in a way that minimizes impact on local communities and shared benefits more fairly. They are working to achieve this on a number of fronts, including they have invested in 480 million in projects to strengthen and modernize the state's grade and address some capacity constraints that are stopping renewable generators getting all their power into the grid. They are carrying out a significant reform to how transmission is planned and delivered called the Victorian Transmission Investment Framework. This reform is aimed at attracting investment and getting the strategic planning of the network right. But the major focus is ensuring earlier and more meaningful engagement with communities and partnerships with traditional owners. And Vigrid has been given the role of leading the coordinated development of offshore wind transmission to make sure that this important new source of energy can be connected to the grid in a way that delivers benefits and minimizes impacts. With that, today we are more than delighted to speak with Mr. Alistair Parker, Chief Executive Officer of Vigrid, as we delve into their strategies. I'm Molly Huang from the Organizing Committee of the Australia Wind Energy 2024. It is my immense pleasure to welcome Mr. Parker here. Welcome. Thank you, Molly, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you. So to begin our interview, Mr. Parker, can you provide us with some insights into Big Great strategy for managing the integration of renewable energy sources into the grid while maintaining a reliable power supply? Certainly, Molly, delighted to. So in Victoria, uh, uh, along with the rest of the world, we're going through, you know, this once in a generation energy transition. So as um, the state's coal fired plants retire, as they age, you know, we have to replace them with renewables. Um, and so that means um, a complete reconfiguring of the transmission network. Um, and so Renewable energy zones um, really offer the opportunity to deliver a number of benefits, um, help us meet our net zero goals by 2050, improve um, energy reliability and affordability for customers and businesses, further um, regional economic development, uh, and that's really important to government, including local jobs, but also improving local infrastructure, um, hopefully create more efficient um, electricity transmission connections uh, and and kind of anticipatory investment in that and, and also then um, improve certainty for renewable investors um, that they know transmission will be ready for them when they come. So our strategy is really to try and integrate these renewable uh, energy sources into the grid in a way that coordinates development and minimizes the impact while uh, on local communities, while making sure we have a reliable um, power supply. So to do that, um, we're reforming uh, the way transmission infrastructure is planned through the Victorian Transmission Investment uh, Framework reforms. So this framework outlines how major transmission infrastructure and reses will be planned, uh, really to take a long-term strategic view, put in place a planning process that really thinks about land use, thinks about um, energy needs, thinks about local communities, um, and really thinks about the range of scenarios uh, that could affect um, affect the future of the electricity system um, and, and put in place every four years, publish a plan that's been well communicated, well consulted on, uh, and that people can really get their fingerprints on. Um, while we're developing that, we're also leading the coordination of transmission to support offshore wind and Victoria's targets for two gigawatts of offshore wind by 2032, four gigawatts by 2035 and, and nine gigawatts by 2040 across Portland and Gippsland. And we're also supporting 
um, the development and delivery of VNI West, um, which will really uh, help diversify Victoria's power supplies. I'm working very closely with the Australian energy market operator there. Thank you, Ms. Alistair, for helping us laying the foundation, laying the blue picture. Zooming into some painful questions, with the increasing adoption of renewable energy, how does Vigria plan to address the challenges of grid congestion and the transmission constraints in the Victoria's energy landscape? Yeah, we know this is really important for investors, and uh, so we'll tackle it on a number of fronts. Under the Victorian Transmission Investment Framework, um, we're proposing new access arrangements for reses, uh, and these will aim to avoid grid congestion by really planning out the access to the system. So um, move away from open access regimes where uh, there's always a risk that somebody can come along and kind of eat your lunch, curtail, curtail your uh, dispatch and, and increase congestion. So um, we're going to establish very clear regulated access particularly in the reses. And we sort of envisage that there'll be a process of increasing commitment for, um, for investors as they, as they come along. Um, and we're also, um, in the more near term sense, we worked on um, some key projects with AEMO, the so-called res stage one projects, where we spent $480 million on 12 projects that really helped strengthen um, the the grid, particularly in the north and west of the state. So this sort of enables, um, you know, we've put in place a synchronous condenser, grid forming battery and a few other things that kind of um, help with the connections, but really key point and something we're really working on closely. And we need to not only consider the internal factors, but some external factors like the environment. How is Big Grid addressing the potential impact of extreme weather events and the natural disaster on the grid infrastructure and ensuring the grid resilience in the face of these challenges? Yeah, it's really important. Um, those stage one projects that I talked about, they will help with resilience. One of the projects is a um, 185 megawatt battery, um, and that will provide system strength in the Murray River res, um, but it also obviously has all the benefits that a battery has. But as we're developing um, our projects, um, and I even think of offshore wind, one of the things that we often hear from the community is making sure that we plan for um, resilience, making sure that we plan for future weather events and so on. And so we will need to make sure um, as we specify equipment, as we think about choices, um, for different design technologies and so on, that we really have that very forward-looking view of what, what is the likely weather impact on it. And as you mentioned, technologies. As Victoria transitions to a low-carbon future, how does VigGrid prioritize investment in grid infrastructure to support the growth of renewable energy projects? For example, like smart grid technologies, energy storage projects, what kind of initiatives or investments are currently on the top of your agenda? Yeah, so it's easy, you know, Vic Grid, it sounds like we're only worried about transmission, but really what we want to do is think holistically about um, different renewable sources, different storage sources, different uh, transmission technologies, different um, demand, what sort of industrial load might we see? And so what we will end up with will be what we have termed an optimal pathway. Uh, and this will set out the most resilient and robust set of projects uh, to develop reses. So the idea is that this optimal pathway will be able to um, cope with lots of different uh, versions of the future. And so we really want to make sure that it optimizes uh, land use, that it optimizes um, the operation of the network, but that it is kind of robust to future scenarios. So I think one of the criticisms people make of the current um, regulated investment test is it's a kind of on average decision. Uh, and what we want to make sure is that we really think about what are some of the things that could go wrong and the optimal pathway we'll need to cover for. So by doing this, um, uh, I think we'll very much minimize the risk of being underprepared. Um, and of course, there's then that balance with 
cost and, and the risk of overinvestment, but we want to really make sure that we have a pathway that goes with many versions of the future. Can I say big grid is more like the safeguard of the overall energy system? Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. Actually, I think that's the thinking we want to bring to this. And speaking of risk mitigation, another factor cannot be ignored is that the grid safety and cybersecurity. What measures does Big Grid have in place to protect critical infrastructure and ensure the reliable delivery of electricity to customers? Really, really important. And today, probably our most important role is making sure we sponsor the right level of cybersecurity and the projects that we're supporting um, and you know, making sure that AEMO standards in this area are comfortably met um, within those projects. So I won't, I won't talk you through all the maturity models and all that sort of stuff. I just think strategically, this is just such an important issue for the industry. We saw in Ukraine um, sort of eight or nine years ago, um, uh, the way that blackouts could be engineered by hostile actors. Um, and so um, it's something that, you know, I know the industry is very alert to, um, really important that everything uh, is within that sort of secure zone and meets all the standards. Um, and there's just so much developing on this. So I think as um, we've got a legislative program that will stand uh, Vicred up and take us more into the day-to-day -day planning of the network as we step into that space, be really vital for us to have that absolute cyber view uh, and cyber security thinking embedded from day one in the projects we do. Yes, and wrapping up today's interview, as most of our audience would be the winged investors, developers, financiers, supply chain partners from globally. So if there's one advice or one key message you would like to give to international counterparts, what the message would be? Yeah, thank you, Molly. And it's really one that Victoria uh, is really open for business. We will have a contestable process um, to develop this transmission. We will go out to market and seek uh, investors and developers. We will be coming out over the course of the next year with expressions of interest for Reses, uh, and we'll be really welcoming good ideas about um, where people can locate and invest in projects. We really want to be as VicGrid, very focused, what does the market need? Um, but also very focused on what do the local communities need and sort of joining the dots in those two issues, I think is going to be really important. So we will really welcome uh, investors and proponents who bring with them first rate social license skills and a real, real ability to engage meaningfully with communities. Thank you so much, Ms. Parker, for your very kind address and sharing. Undoubted, Big Grid's proactive stance in the renewable energy industry sets an example for other grid operators to learn and follow. Once again, we thank you for your generosity in sharing the knowledge. In the meantime, we eagerly anticipate your presence at the upcoming Australia Wind Energy 2024 in Melbourne next year. Thanks ever so much, Molly. It's been a pleasure.